we turn on this uh, thing. Testing, testing. Is it on? Uh, should be on. Testing. Oh, there it is. It's way too on. Okay, great. All right. Well, <clears throat> this is always a very welcoming uh, venue here. We always look forward to coming here. Um, yeah, I was asked if I'd speak on uh, sexual purity, which, of course, although talking about sex is almost always uh, likely to draw a lot of interested uh, people, uh, there's hardly anything that people are more interested in, uh, yeah, at least, you know, at a certain level, uh, then the subject of sex, although the subject of sexual purity is not anywhere near as interesting, or what's well, maybe interesting is not as popular, let's put it that way. I, um, <clears throat> I, a lot of people like to hear about sex or think about sex or um, whatever, but, but to hear about sexual purity, uh, it takes a special kind of person to want to hear about that. Uh, usually it's somebody who is trying to defeat the world and the flesh and the devil, which is what we want to do. And, uh, and, and the sex, sexual urges, sexual drives are among the strongest that we have. They're not the strongest, but the other, the other ones don't require so much restriction. Actually, the, the desire to breathe is the strongest urge we have, and we'll, we'll die most quickly if we don't indulge that urge. Uh, drinking uh, water, for example, or liquid, that's a strong urge too, and we'll die within a few days if we don't indulge that one. Eating, obviously, is a strong appetite. Uh, sleep is a strong natural appetite, and so is sex. The difference between uh, sex and the other ones is there's much more restriction on the, the legitimate use of that. I mean, I don't know of any restrictions on breathing uh, or, or drinking liquid. Um, of course, there's such a thing as gluttony. You don't want to eat too much, but, uh, but there's no specific, you know, boundaries about eating, except, of course, to the Christian. Paul said, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. But those are all activities that you can indulge in a great deal, uh, almost whenever you want to, and there's, it's not a moral issue. In fact, Paul made that very clear, that it's not a moral issue. Because when he wrote to the Corinthians, he had to explain to them that the indulgence of the sexual appetite is not on the same level as the indulgence of the food appetite. Because when Paul had come to Corinth and planted the church there originally, he was carrying a letter from the Jerusalem Council, about which we read in Acts chapter 15. And the Jerusalem Council was there to decide whether the, the converts to Christianity out of the pagan world, whether they needed to become Jews before they could actually be regarded full-on Christians. And becoming a Jew for a pagan means you, you get circumcised. And you get circumcised and you agree to keep the law of Moses. Now, when you and I hear about the law of Moses, it, it may be that the first thing you think of is you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, those kind of laws, Ten Commandment type laws. But really what was at, at issue was whether they had to keep all those ritual laws. Don't eat this, don't eat that. You know, don't touch this, don't touch that, you'll be unclean. Uh, make sure you, um, you know, observe special ho holidays, holy days and rituals. That's, that, those are the laws that were at issue because everyone who knows God knows you can't go out and murder and commit adultery and steal, but, but uh, there was some question in the church. What about these other rituals that distinguish the Jews from Gentiles? If a Gentile wants to be saved, uh, should they become a Jew first so that they can <coughs> keep all the same rules that the early Christians who were all Jews kept? And of course the Jerusalem Council made the decision that that's not necessary. And Gentiles don't have to adopt these laws, but they did say, however, Gentiles do a lot of things with their liberty that might offend the Jews in their towns. And every town has had the synagogues there preaching the law of Moses for many generations, as they said. And therefore, we would like to request that the Gentiles, even though they don't have to come under the Jewish law, we'd like to ask them to restrain from certain things that are particularly offensive to their Jewish neighbors, because we frankly don't want to offend the Jews, we'd like to keep, make them open-minded about becoming Christians themselves, which they won't if they look at Gentile Christians as you know, debauched you know, people who do disgusting things. And so they made a list of four things. They said you know, to Paul and, and Barnabas, when you go out to the Gentile churches, please tell them 
We're not requiring them to get circumcised or keep the law, but we would like them to refrain from these four things. And those four things were eating blood, eating animals that had been strangled, eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols, and fornication. Now, when Paul came to Corinth and, and other Gentile cities, he delivered this letter from the council, and they said, listen, he said, listen, uh, the, you're Gentiles, you don't have to keep the Jewish law, you don't have to please the Jews, but there are some things, offensive things to the Jews, that the brothers in Jerusalem would like for you to avoid. And that is eating blood, eating things strangled, eating meat sacrificed idols, and fornication. Now Paul was not as stringent about the eating things. Paul knew, for example, that Jesus had said, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you, it's what comes out of your mouth. So he made all foods clean. In fact, in Romans 14, 14, Paul said, I know and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ that there's nothing unclean of itself. But to him who eats it, if he thinks it's unclean, it's unclean to him. But in other words, Paul had a lot of liberty about that. And he didn't want, uh, he didn't want his converts to get the wrong impression. Like if they would eat an unclean food of some kind, that somehow they're, they're going to go to hell or God's angry at them. So... I, I believe, and we don't read of him teaching this, but we can see that he did because of how he had to correct them when he wrote to them later. Uh, he must have said, you know, these four things the council wanted you to do, but frankly, you know, God doesn't care that much what you eat and drink. It's, this is just a consideration of not offending other people. Uh, the Jews will be offended if they see you eat blood or eat meat sacrifice. So they're asking you not to do this. It's a matter of just not offending people. It's not really a matter of uh, of sin in the sight of God. Well, when Paul left, some of the teachers in Corinth were saying, well, Paul said all things are lawful for us. Uh, and uh, yeah, the Jerusalem Council said, don't do these things, but Paul said, God doesn't care about these things. Now, what they failed to make the distinction about was dietary laws versus fornication. So that list of four things, three of them had to do with what you eat, one had to do with fornication. And, the, and we have to remember that the Greek culture and Greek religions did not see fornication as a moral issue. Uh, if anything, it was part of their religion to fornicate. In Corinth, for example, there was a temple to Aphrodite, the Greek god of, goddess of love, and there were a thousand prostitutes there that were the priestesses of that religion. If you wanted to worship Aphrodite, you'd, you'd uh, you know, use the services of these prostitute priestesses. I mean, to us as Christians, or even Jews, we're like, that's absolutely, how can anyone think that's good? Well, the pagans were in darkness. They didn't know. Uh, to them, indulging their sex drive was just like indulging your appetite for food. And I go into all this only because we have now come full circle to a time in Western civilization where that's kind of the dominant attitude about the matter, too. You, you, of course, you desire to eat, and therefore, when you're hungry, you eat. If you desire to have sex, well, you just have sex. Uh, you can eat whatever you want to. You can also have sex with whoever you want to. And this is how our culture thinks who are not informed by Scripture. Now, frankly, when I was growing up, and when you older people were growing up, uh, the society knew that fornication was not the same thing as, say, gluttony, or, or eating, you know, uh, too much sugar, or, or, or something like that. Uh, fornication in America still is viewed as a sin in, even among the non-Christians. They still did it, many of them, but they were ashamed for it to be known. If a, if a girl got pregnant outside of marriage, it was considered to be shameful. Not because she got caught, but because it means she was engaged in uh, sex outside of marriage, which was considered to be morally uh, scandalous. If people got divorced, it was considered to be scandalous within my lifetime. Um, you know, uh, and if people, if kids were sleeping together, uh, you know, they wouldn't move in together, you know, without getting married. They, they might sleep secretly with each other. Moving in together is a very rare thing until at least the hippie movement came in the sexual revolution in the 60s. Because even though most of America was never comprised of Christians, it was nonetheless influenced by Christianity to such a degree. And people had such a reverence and even fear of the Bible. Yeah, many didn't want to obey it, and didn't, but they still knew the Bible, that's the Word of God. The Bible, that's the good book. Now, of course, we've come to a point in a single generation, 
where even the unbelievers believed that the biblical norms of morality were, were good, even if they didn't want to submit to them. They knew they were good. They knew we should. To, we come around a place where even the Christians aren't sure whether the biblical norms are good. I mean, we, it shouldn't surprise us that people who don't know anything about God or about, about the Bible or don't care about God or the Bible, if they just indulge whatever desires they have, uh, they answer to no higher power that they know of. But what's, what's scary, really, is that we now have the world's philosophy of this uh, permeating the church. And, you know, Paul did make a distinction between unbelievers and believers in this matter. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in an epistle. There was apparently an epistle that Paul wrote to the Corinthians before 1 Corinthians. We don't have that, but he mentions it. He says, I wrote to you in an epistle not to associate with fornicators. But he said, I didn't mean the fornicators of this world, that is the pagans. Of course, he says, you have to go out of the world to avoid them. I mean, all, all the pagans are fornicators. And uh, I'm not saying you can't associate with non-Christians who are fornicators, but he said, if anyone calls himself a brother, that is, if they're a professing Christian, and they're a fornicator, don't have anything to do with them. He's saying, you know, we, it's wrong for pagans to fornicate, but we can't dictate to them what they do. They're not committed to following Jesus. We can call them to follow Jesus. We can call them to commit themselves to Jesus. But as long as they haven't done that, we can't dictate moral norms to them. It's only those who have submitted to Christ and recognized his authority who are required to live the way he said. The pagans are required to do it in a sense by God, but we can't require them to do it. They'll be judged for not doing it, but we're not in the position to judge them. In that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 5, Paul said, for what have I to do with judging those who are outside the church? We need to judge those who are inside the church, those who are outside God judges. So if people sin, they're going to get judged. But those outside the church will be judged by God, and those inside the church, we're supposed to judge. The church is supposed to maintain its own high standards in order that it's distinctive from the world in terms of its obedience and likeness to Christ. Now, so we want to talk about the distinctive attitude towards sexual purity that comes with being a Christian. And I have to say, uh, fornication, it's, it's, it's not even regarded to be shameful in many churches. I think most pastors, even the most liberal of them, if they were asked whether people should fornicate, first of all, they'd feel uncomfortable with the word fornicate. Fornicate, that just sounds so sinful. They, they, just, they, just, they just love each other. No, they don't just love each other. They're having sex. That's not the same thing. It's, it's great if when you are having a legitimate sexual relationship in, within the bonds of marriage, if there's love there. But love and sex are not the same thing. And when, uh, you know, especially we, we began to hear in the past decade, mostly from, from the, the gay activists, they say, well, you know, you can't tell us who to love. No one can tell you who you can love. I've said, I've never had the slightest interest in telling you who you can love. I think you ought to love everybody. The Bible says you should love your enemies and love your friends and love your wife and love your children. Loving people is what we're supposed to do. That's not the same thing. We're not saying that you shouldn't love whoever you want to love. In fact, you should probably love a lot of people you don't want to love. We're not talking about love, we're talking about sex. Love should be universal. Sex obviously should be restricted because God made it for a purpose and that's a very special purpose. And the reason that Christian ethics forbids all sex outside of marriage is not because sex is a dirty thing. If that were so, we'd be saying only married people are allowed to get dirty, you know? No, marriage is honorable. It says in Hebrews 13, marriage is honorable among all and, this, and the bed is undefiled. But adulterers and fornicators, God will judge, it says. Now, it's not that sex is a dirty thing, it's the opposite. God made sex for a very specific purpose, and it's a very sacred purpose, very restricted. Just like, uh, you know, the temple could only be used for one thing because it was set aside for that one thing. So sexuality is set aside for one thing, and that is marriage. That's what God made it for. And we have to remember that it is God who thought up sex. Again, if a lot of people, 
And I find this used to be true, I don't know if it still is with a lot of people who are raised Catholic, but probably some Protestants too, but Catholics uh, my age, many of them were raised with the idea that sex is dirty, even in marriage. Just sex is just a dirty category. It's a, an unnecessary evil. You got to do it to reproduce the human race, but you got to feel bad about it at least. Uh, you can't feel good about it. And this is a very harmful thing. It's been very harmful for marriages, especially if, uh, if one or both of the parties, especially if it's the woman, was raised with these ideas that you know, sex is something that maybe you have to do to have kids, but you, you better not think it's okay, and you, you just maybe have to go do penance or something afterwards. I don't think they really have that view, but the point is, sex is never seen in the Bible as a dirty thing. It is restricted because it's a sacred thing. It's not something you just throw out in the gutter and, and, and that just let everyone at it. It's got a very specific purpose. And we need to talk about that first before we talk about the wrong uses of sex. Because, some, you know, if you stand for biblical norms about sexuality, someone's going to say you're uh, homophobic or transphobic. Or, you know, if, you, if you're not moving with the culture on their changing views about sexual norms, they'll say you're phobic, which literally means afraid. Now, I'm not at all afraid of homosexuals. I've never met a homosexual I was afraid of, except one guy, when I was a young kid, uh, teenager, hitchhiking, and I got picked up by this really big guy, and uh, I just wanted a ride. He wanted something else, so when I found out what he wanted, I said, I'll get off at this ramp now. But it was, he was, uh, he was, you know, propositioning me. Now, I was kind of scared there, because I was little, he was big, and he was the aggressor. I mean, but I, I in general, uh, you know, that's not, if, if it had been a big woman that was trying to do that to me, I would have felt the same way. It's not, home, it's not his sex, it's the issue, you know? And uh, I know, of course, as you do, numerous people who are homosexuals, as they say, they identify as that way, but I can't remember being afraid of any of them. There's, to call it homophobia is ridiculous. But it is not ridiculous to say, I'm a little concerned, maybe even a little afraid, of, uh, of the, 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 the uh, homosexual movement activists that are trying to destroy all the sexual norms. Not because it'll hurt me. Once again, uh, you know, when uh, they were still campaigning for same-sex marriage, they say, well, what do you care about? It won't hurt your marriage. You know, if these two gay people can get married to each other, how does that affect you? And my answer was, I, I don't think it affects me at all. But I'm not just concerned about me. If I was a narcissist like you are, I, I judge everything by how does it affect me. I'm not a narcissist. I'm concerned about my fellow man. I'm concerned about I'm concerned about my children, my grandchildren. I'm concerned about the society that we leave to them and the confusion that comes if they were raised in a society where nobody knows what marriage is, which every society in history knew until the past 30 years. And, uh, and, and if you just, if people don't know what marriage is for, if they don't know what sex is for, we have, we have yet to see the damage that can be done, but we've seen a lot of it. We've seen the trend. I think it can get a lot worse. I guess Sodom and Gomorrah probably went f further down that path than we have yet, or more, more universally. I mean, we've got people, <laughs> we've got some pockets of society that are probably about like Sodom and Gomorrah, but there's still a lot of uh, Christian uh, values among people who aren't in that pocket. But frankly, a society that forgets what marriage is, what family is, what sex is, is a society that's frankly doomed to, to disintegrate and, and have many, many victims. Um, and so, I mean, the reason I don't want there to be, although there is, confusion over what marriage is, is because, not because of me, I, I, my wife and I are not confused about what it is. My kids are, I don't think, confused about what it is. My grandkids, who knows what they all know. <laughs> and great grandkids. Now, I, we're concerned about issues because God cares about them, and God cares about them because God cares about people. And we care about people. And we say, if you depart from God's norms, people will suffer. You, yourself, will suffer if you depart from them. But if a society does, that society will suffer. That's, we need to understand that God, when he made human beings, the first society he built was a marriage. There was a man alone. 
And God said, it's not good for a man to be alone, so I'm going to make a helper for him. And this was the first relationship and the first social entity that God created. And, and it's defined in Genesis 2, 24, where it says, for this cause, a man will leave his father and his mother and will cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, what does that mean? Well, we might not know if Jesus hadn't quoted it and expounded it. And by the way, Paul did too. That very verse, Genesis 2.24, was quoted by Jesus and by Paul. In the case of Jesus' quotation of it, he was saying, listen, uh, have you not read how God made things in the beginning? And this was an answer to a question that was actually about divorce, which is extremely relevant to the whole issue of family and marriage and sexual norms. But he was asked about divorce because in some religions, all, almost all religions, Divorce is permitted in some cases, but the question is, for what cases? And the Pharisees didn't have the same opinion as each other. There's the school of Shammai that allowed divorce for only uh, fornication, uh, and there's a school of Hillel that allowed divorce for just about any reason a man wanted it. And uh, so they came and said, Jesus, is, uh, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? And they're asking Jesus to give his opinion between the two denominations uh, within the Pharisees, the Shammites and the Hillelites. And Jesus said, well, haven't you heard how God made it from the beginning? How he said that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And then he said, what God has joined together, and of course he gets that from that last line of the quote, they become one flesh. They become one flesh not by some human action, but by God's action. God joins them together as one. He says, what God is doing together, do not let man break apart. So he's saying, if you knew your, the scriptures, you'd know that it was God who created marriage. It's God who said that they are now one flesh by God's decree and by God's uh, design. And if you break it apart, you're going against God. So don't divorce. And they said to him, well, then why did Moses allow us to give a writing of divorcement and divorce our wives. Jesus said, well, because of the hardness of your heart, God permitted that, but it, from the beginning, it was not so. Now, by that statement, from the beginning, it was not so. He's saying, we should not be concerned about what God will permit due to the fallen state of things where God endures a great deal of disappointment with people's behavior. How much will God tolerate? That's not, our, that's not what we should be asking. A lot of people... Uh, when I was young and a teenager, that's when I started teaching uh, the Bible, and, and most people I was teaching were teenagers too. And I often asked, you know, what can you do on a date? Can you do this much or that much? And they explained different activities that they were apparently tempted to do. You know, as a Christian, can you do that? Can you do that? And I was saying, as I'll say tonight, the Christian's concern is not how much can I get away with. Our question is not how far can we get from the known will of God and still be okay. That's religion. We're not advocating religion. We're, we're advocating a relationship with God where you love God and you want to please God and you're not concerned about how much he may forgive, but how much he wants. Not what will he permit and, how, and what will he tolerate? But really, what will please him? What makes him happy? And so Jesus said, yeah, God permitted you to divorce your wife, but it wasn't that way from the beginning. In other words, God didn't make Adam and Eve uh, with the mind for them to divorce, and they didn't. It wasn't until the law of Moses was given that there, were, uh, you know, some, there was some permission to divorce in certain cases. And I believe there still is in certain cases. Not half as many as people would like there to be. But Jesus said, yeah, but God didn't make it that way at the beginning. And by that statement, he's saying, instead of wondering how much God may tolerate, why don't we ask if we can get a, get a fix on what is the perfect will of God? I think we can get a clue from seeing how he made things. How did he want human sexuality to be? Now, you have to remember that God could have made humans asexual. There, there are a class of living things that are asexual. There are microorganisms that reproduce without a mate. 
or even some strange, uh, rare uh, sea creatures that seem to uh, be able to reproduce without a mate. In fact, I didn't know this until recently, but there are pythons and even Komodo dragons that have been known in zoos to become pregnant and lay eggs without being exposed to a mate. Uh, there's apparently some very rare cases where some animals, and we know of some that are made to do this, they reproduce without a mate, they're asexual. Now, in the cases of the pythons and the Komodo dragons, they are not asexual, but they seem to be an exception. They, they usually reproduce sexually like most creatures, but I guess there can be exceptions with them. But with people, there's not. The only case we know of of a virgin birth was a miracle and a one-time deal. It was a one-off. You know, it wasn't something that happens occasionally or rarely. It was a unique case. There's, it's not going to happen again. never happened before that. But God made us the way he wanted us. He didn't make us asexual. He made us sexual. When God says it's not man, good for man to be alone, I'm going to make a helper for him. Actually, a helper uh, equal to him is pretty much what the phrase means. But if God wants to make someone equal to him, he could have just made another man, couldn't he? Why didn't he make, you know, a man to, to be a companion for Adam? They could, they could both be asexual creatures that didn't have sex with each other or anyone else. And God made, could have made them to reproduce like amoebas do. But they could just be friends. If, if, if it's bad for a man to be alone because it's lonely, well, he can have friends. Interestingly, many men find, their, even if they have no sexual attraction, they find more camaraderie with other men. I think many women find more camaraderie with other women. Uh, God didn't just make a man and a woman because that, that was the best way to have companions because they could have had other kinds of companions. Uh, what he made was creatures, two different varieties of the same species that fit together like a key and a lock. And a key and a lock are one mechanism. You know, you go to a hardware store, you don't find the locks over here, and you buy one of those and you go find a key over in another section. The key and the lock come together because they are made to work together. They're made, they're not the same as each other, but they both are necessary. And, uh, and God made it so that men and women are necessary to each other to, uh, to do what's supposed to happen with them. Now, what was supposed to happen with them? Well, the first instructions God gave them was, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. We know from that that sex was not a dirty thing or a bad thing. It was a command of God. He gave them no way to reproduce other than sexually, so he expected them to be sexually active. That's what he made them for. In fact, God doesn't have to make things that are necessary pleasant. God is, does that only because he's good, because he's loving. Do you realize that God could make us so that we could be nourished by food that has no flavor at all? But he made all these different flavors and he gave us taste buds. We, if we had no capacity to taste, we could still be required to eat. It's necessary biologically for us to eat. And God just gave us taste buds and all these different flavors because he just happened. He wants, he wants us to enjoy it. He's not required to do that. That's just out of his generosity. Likewise, with reproduction, he could have made it necessary for people to reproduce, reproduce sexually, but made it very bland or not particularly enjoyable. But God, since there are things he wanted to make sure we don't neglect, because they're essential for the human race and even for our own good, he made those things most important and most uh, indispensable, also pleasurable, so that we'd have the we'd enjoy them, and so that we wouldn't neglect them. Um, so God made sex. God made the sex organs, he made the sex drive, he made the hormones that make people interested in sex. You know, we don't realize this because we, we, we do not exist without hormones, but if we just didn't have the chemicals we have in our bodies, male and female hormones, there would be no interest in sex. It still might be, I mean, we wouldn't even be able to engage that, but the point is, God put the right chemicals in us so that we'd be drawn to that and it would be enjoyable and it would be fruitful and we would multiply and fill the earth. That's what God made. And that's what God, that's the only place in which God wants there to be sex. Now, 
there's there may be practical reasons why it's better not to have sex outside of marriage but there's one very important spiritual reason and that's what Paul tells us in first Corinthians excuse me in this case Ephesians 5 and uh, he, he also like Jesus did he quotes Genesis 224 for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother cling to his wife and they too shall be grown in flesh Paul quotes that just like Jesus did but then Paul says this is a great mystery but I'm speaking of Christ and the church now what Paul's saying is sex of course in addition to the obvious purpose of reproduction which I mean the human race would die off within a few years if there was no reproduction so that God made it for that but he also made it to be a picture of Christ and the church. That is a picture of the relationship God wants to have with his people. And that's why in that context in Ephesians 5, Paul says, uh, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ and all things. Why? Because God made marriage to be a picture of that. Now what's interesting is part of marriage is obviously sex. And is, is that kind of outside the realm of the general purpose of marriage? If the general purpose of marriage is to be like Christ in the church, is it kind of dirty to think of, you know, sex between married partners as, as involved in, in, in that, reflecting that reality too? I think not. You know, this idea of God being married to his people comes from the Old Testament. We get it in the New Testament, Christ and the church. In the Old Testament, the same analogy was used for Israel and God. At Mount Sinai, God entered a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. He may enter into a covenant relationship with Israel. Collectively, Israel was his wife, he said. And the most important thing to him was that they don't worship other gods. Why? He said that would be cheating. That would be adultery. And, you know, it's interesting in the Old Testament how often you find uh, certain, for example, certain leaders in Israel... Uh, they do all kinds of things wrong. And sometimes God still sees them as, say, a good king. But another king doesn't do more things wrong, but he's considered a bad king. But the difference is the bad king was the one who led Israel to worshiping idols. God doesn't want us to do any sins at all. But many sins will be tolerated more than others. Just like in marriage. In marriage, uh, you know, a husband and wife, they make promises to each other. Their promises are they'll be perfect. Ever heard of marriage vows? I mean, I'm going to be perfect. I'm going to love you, cherish you. I'll, you know, I'll die for you. I'm going to, you know, be, I'll be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. And she says the same thing to him. And, and hopefully they mean it. I think in many cases they do. But the spirit may be willing and the flesh is weak and people are very flawed. And therefore all marriages are characterized by flawed partners. And flaws in your partner can be annoying. They can be painful. They can be uh, expensive, depending on the kind of flaws they have. So you, the guy's got a gambling problem or something, you know? Um, or, or a wife's just unrestrained in her spending and you know, drives, the, drives the family and broke. I mean, they're, they're flaws in a partner can be very costly, can be very painful, can be very annoying, and very tempting to say, I'm out of here. I'm going to bail. But Jesus said, no, the only grounds for divorce is fornication. He said, if a man divorces his wife for any cause other than fornication, he causes her to commit adultery, and he himself, when he remarries, commits adultery. So uh, nothing can break that marriage covenant except fornication. That is, one of them having sex with somebody else who's not their partner. Every other thing, she may burn the food, she may be unpleasant, he may snore, he may leave the toilet seat up, she may have an annoying laugh, he may not use deodorant or bathe often enough. And, I mean, I, I have, I've known some people, good, nice people, who've got terrible breath. I think, how does their spouse... I tell them about this. I mean, it just, it's like, I, I, when they're talking about it, I really think, am I going to survive this? It's almost like, uh, you, know, you know, mustard gas or something, uh, you know, it's chemical warfare. Uh, 
honestly, there's some very annoying things that people have that really challenge their ability to be, uh, you know, with each other and live with each other. But none of those things are grounds for divorce. But if one of them goes out and sleeps with someone else, that is grounds for divorce. Just like with Israel. God didn't divorce Israel because she kept being carnal in many, many ways, which displeased him. It's just, just like if your husband or wife has annoying habits, it displeases you. But being displeased is not grounds for breaking up. The only thing it is, when Israel went after other gods, God said, that's like a wife going after other men. In other words, the sexual relationship between a husband and wife is analogous to worship between God's people and him. You shall worship the Lord your God and him alone shall you serve, Jesus said in response to the devil's temptation uh, in Luke 4 and Matthew 4. And to worship God only is the obligation of God's people, just like to only sleep with your partner is the obligation of married people. Now, interesting that God, in trying to build on earth in a human relationship, an analogy to his relationship with his people, and in looking for something to correspond to the phenomenon of, of unique worship, created a unique sexual obligation. As if the sexual relationship is itself uh, a picture of worship. And of course, worship, if you love somebody, if you love God, worshiping him is extremely pleasurable. In fact, it can be, it may not have been in the experience of everybody here, but I've certainly known times, it can be more ecstatic than any other earthly experience on occasion. That's what it should be. Uh, and you can't always be blamed if it isn't because you we're not perfect people, but in ideal worship situations, you feel elevated in the heavenlies. Sex can be like that too, between married partners. I mean, it's, I mean, sex is a good analogy for worship because people who don't worship God worship sex anyway. I mean, sex is the kind of thing that the world is drawn to worship, which is why Corinth had a thousand prostitutes in their temple. What were they worshiping there? Aphrodite, the goddess of sex, really. Men, whether they do it so blatantly as the Corinthians did or otherwise, if they aren't loyal to God, they're going to probably, more often than not, be worshiping uh, and serving sex because their drive is very strong and there are things about it that uh, are, are uniquely pleasurable. There's many pleasures in life, but that's the pleasure in that relationship at its, at its best <clears throat> is, uh, is not like anything else. And that's, God made that to be a picture of, uh, of the way we express our love to him in worship. Now, I, I, you know, there's children here and so forth, so I don't want to be too explicit, but I, I used to wonder, why do so many animals, when they reproduce, do it not face to face? If you've had dogs or cows or horses or goats, we've had all of them, uh, my family, I, I mean, you, when they reproduce, they're not looking at each other face to face. They're just doing a deed to get the job done. But God made humans to be face to face in that encounter. Because I believe it is a picture of our worship in him. All we with unveiled faces beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord are changed from glory to glory through that same, into that same image where it's a face to face encounter with God when we worship God. So, I mean, there's many analogies there, but the point I'm trying to make is, even if we, ha if we don't fathom all the analogies or don't understand them all, we're dealing with something that's unique here. We're talking about something that's not just a biological drive that has no other meaning. And so when Paul found that the Corinthians were even confused about that in 1 Corinthians 6, when they were saying, oh, Paul said all things are lawful, and that meant we can go have, we can fornicate as well as eat these other things, he wrote to them in chapter 6 and said, wait a minute, wait, all things are lawful, but not all things edify. And he said, food is for the body, and the body is for food, and God will destroy the stomach and, and, and the food. Eventually, they're not permanent, but the body was not made for fornication. In other words, he's saying that the Jerusalem council asked you to refrain from eating certain things. And I'm telling you, God's not all about that. He's not all about what you eat. If you don't 
eat one thing or you do eat another thing, that's not an issue to God. What enters your mouth is not what defiles you, so it comes out from your heart. But fornication is in the list, but it's not in the same category. The, the appetite for food is not, or the indulgence of the appetite for food is not in the same category as the indulgence of the sex drive. Because food doesn't have that same spiritual significance as God built into the uniqueness of the marriage relationship. And that's, God guards over that more jealously. Just like, well, just like a husband and wife do. At least the one who's not cheating. Obviously, a husband and wife can both be tempted to cheat because we can be tempted to do almost anything. Almost anything that's pleasurable. We can be tempted to. That's the nature of being human, frankly. But the person who doesn't want to cheat, when they suspect or know that their spouse wants to cheat or is cheating, that's not just something to say, oh, well, you know, she never was a good cook anyway, so who, who do I care who she's sleeping with? No, I, no man thinks like that, unless he's already given up on the marriage himself. Anyone who cares about their marriage realizes that, uh, you know, sexual faithfulness of their spouse matters more than anything else. In fact, it has been said that adultery is the most cruel, nonviolent act that one can do against another person. There are perhaps more cruel things you can do physically, uh, you know, torture someone, you know, kill somebody, burn somebody at the stake. I mean, there are, there are violent acts that might be more cruel, but among nonviolent acts, there's nothing more cruel than adultery and, and nothing that is more likely to go unpardoned by the cheated party. Solomon says that as he's telling his son to make sure he avoids being seduced by other men's wives. Now it's interesting, Solomon in Proverbs is, says a lot about the strange woman, the foreign woman, the, uh, you know, the, the, he's talking about a prostitute, but he's always describing, in those cases, a married woman who's prostituting. You know, she says, my husband's gone on a long trip, he's taken a lot of money, he won't be back for a while, come on over. And, uh, you know, it's typical, but that's not because, um, it, it's not because that's the only prostitute that's wanted to go to. It's just that in Jewish society, almost all young girls were married. And some of them, you know, were not very faithful to their husbands. And, and maybe, of course, a lot of young girls married old men. This is kind of typical in, in Middle Eastern society. Uh, it, maybe the woman was not very satisfied with her husband. So she you know, was tempted to go another way. But what Solomon says to his son uh, about this, he said in verse 26, uh, well, in verse 25, he says, Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Now, that makes it look like she's the bad guy. You know, she's preying, she's the predator, and so forth. Well, some women are. Obviously, men are predators maybe more often. I don't know, you women might know more than I do about how predatory women are. Uh, I'm not, I've never been inside a woman's brain. I've been married for many years to a woman, but that doesn't guarantee that you have any understanding of what goes on inside their brain. Uh, as, as husbands know, and frankly wives know too. Well, yeah, my husband doesn't understand any, you see. And, and honestly, not to get off on this, but women do usually expect their husbands to know what's going on inside their brains. And that's one of the great complaints that husbands have. I can't read her mind and she gets mad at me because I don't. Well, we won't get into that, but I'm not sure of an easy solution to that. I will say this, I've never been inside a woman's head. I've been in a man's head. And I'm much more, I, I've, I've known more men and talked about these kinds of issues with more men than with women. And I know men are predatory. But I'm saying you women might know, yeah, well, women I know. There are a lot of predatory women out there too. I know there are some. Solomon knew of some because he had observed it. He actually started watching out the window once and a young man who had no good sense to him was walking down the, uh, the Harlot Street and she came out and she was alluring him and, and tempting him and flattering him. And, and you know, I mean, so there, there are uh, 
predators both ways. But he said, he's thinking in terms of, you know, avoid these predatory women. He says, for by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Obviously, men who are predatory do the same thing in, in the other direction. He says, can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Now, this comparison of sexual misbehavior with taking coals of fire into your, into, you know, into your clothing, how can you do that and your clothes don't get burned? Now, anyone who's been in the church for very long and has heard, especially in youth groups, talks about, you know, stay away from sexual sin, has heard the analogy of sex and fire. Maybe you weren't raised in the church and didn't hear that, but I've heard it more times than I can remember. It's a very good one. It's, it's biblical. You see, the, what, what preachers often say, and what we often need to hear, is there's nothing wrong with fire, just like there's nothing wrong with sex. As long as the fire is in the fireplace or in a place that is safe to be, where it's supposed to be. But once the fire leaps out of the fireplace onto the carpet, or onto the curtains, or onto the furniture, then you've got serious destruction going on. We have a family here who were, had a house in paradise that burned down a few years ago. And many of you are close enough to paradise to remember that. I remember it. I wasn't very close to it. But I mean, how destructive fire is when it gets out of the areas that it's useful. Fire is useful for cooking, for heating, and for a number of things. Disinfecting, but it's not useful when it gets out of control, when it's outside the boundaries that you want it to be in. Then it's nothing but destructive. And, and that's, of course, how the sex drive is. As long as your sex drive is in the boundaries where God wants it, which is in marriage, it, there's not a thing wrong with it. But as soon as it gets outside there, it starts destroying everything. It destroys the lives of everyone involved and many others besides. Uh, for example, I mean, almost always, there's some exceptions, but almost always where adultery is found out in a marriage, generally speaking, a divorce follows. Now, there's some godly people. I, I frankly, in my first marriage, I got married when I was 19. I thought I was married a Christian woman. She had a few affairs. She even told me about them. She didn't repent, but she, did, she wasn't ashamed. She was a hippie. I thought she was converted. I guess she still was a hippie and not very converted. Now, I, because I was a Christian, I thought, well, I have grounds for divorce, but I don't want a divorce. I mean, I don't like living with this woman, but I'm a Christian. I, it's, a, it's a shame. It's a reproach to Christ. I'm not going to divorce her. I determined I would stay with her for the rest of my life like I pledged I would at, at the when I made my vows because Christians should keep their promises. They should be different than worldly people in that very respect, that you can trust Christians because they won't break their promises. And, um, and the reason is because we're supposed to reflect Christ to the world and we want people to be able to trust him, knowing that he doesn't break his promises. And if you've never met anyone who doesn't break their promises, so you can't even fathom that. Look at me. I don't break mine. That's what a Christian should be able to say. I will not misrepresent God by becoming unfaithful. Now, I had grounds for divorce, but I wouldn't take it. Because I thought, well, I did make promises. Uh, and so I didn't. And, and I would be still married to that woman, and she'd probably still be having affairs to this day, you know, which is now 50-something years later if she hadn't run off with someone else and divorced me, which was, I have to say, a divorce made in heaven. Um, but, uh, but a reproach still. It's still a reproach. Even, even if it's a relief, it's a, it's a reproach. I didn't want it. But the point I'm making is, most cases of discovered adultery end up in divorce. I don't think, I don't think one man in 20 would stay married permanently to a woman who he knows is having affairs. Some would. Sometimes they're just desperate. They don't think they'll find anyone else. And there may be other, they might do it for the kids, whatever. There are reasons some people would. But do, adultery almost always ends marriages. And the end of a marriage ends the prospects of, of very many people to have their dreams, their godly dreams come true. The children, most of all. Children are very much victimized by divorce. And, and you know, the, the worldly people are going to say, oh, no, kids are very resilient. They're resilient. And, and many times the divorcing spouse says, well, it's better for the kids that we live apart 
and be at peace with each other than that we live in the house and they, they witness this friction and fighting all the time. Well, how about a third option? How about live together and don't have all that friction and fighting all the time? How about be a godly person and don't, don't contribute to any strife? Now, sure, one partner can do all the fighting, but a fight doesn't really escalate very much if only one person's doing it. And there are options. You don't have to divorce, you have to separate, but people make all kinds of excuses for divorcing because really the truth is they want out. It's the easy way. The hard way is to stay and make it work. But you know, it is not true that the children benefit more from a couple breaking up and living peaceably apart than staying together. Almost every children of divorced families that have ever been interviewed said they wish their parents had stayed together. And of course, the children of divorced marriages are in a high risk group for all kinds of antisocial behaviors, including addictions and you know, immorality and other horrible things. You don't want to list here. They're distastefully mentioned, but frankly, uh, studies have proven this beyond the shadow of a doubt. If you divorce your spouse and you've got kids, you are instantly relegating your kids into a category that is like 80% like more likely to commit suicide, be promiscuous, have their own marriages break up someday. Uh, I mean, get, get on drugs, whatever. Uh, all bad stuff. And so it's, it's I, I think divorcing your spouse should be a category of uh, child abuse, really. But not just children, but children's important enough. If children were the only people hurt by it, that'd be an incredibly persuasive reason not to do it. But other people destroy it. And the worst of it is, the reputation of Christ is destroyed. Um, so, I'm, we're not talking about divorce tonight, but divorce is a very natural product of adultery, uh, a result of adultery. Uh, either it is caused because of adultery, or it itself be is adultery. So there's never a divorce where there's not adultery. Either adultery is the grounds for the divorce, which would not be there if there's no adultery, in which case the person who's, who was faithful and is out, they're, they're innocent, okay? They're the innocent party. But either adultery causes the divorce, or else the divorce itself is adultery. If you divorce your spouse and it wasn't for cause of adultery, you're committing adultery, at least if you remarry. And, that, and most people seek to do that. So it's all bad. You know, just getting the fire out of the fireplace into the carpet is destructive beyond calculation. And so this is one reason that Christians should be committed, even if it weren't otherwise an offense to God. We should be, for the sake of the other harm that it does, unwilling to, uh, to be unrestrained in our, in our attitudes. Now, the Bible would say, well, what about, um, what about unmarried people, you know, having premarital sex? Well, you know, that specific situation isn't mentioned very often in Scripture. I will say this, the law of Moses does show what, where the heart of God is on this matter, because if people are married, or a, a single person has uh, sex with a married person who's not married to them, that's adultery. And where there's adultery, both parties are put to death. It's a capital crime. It's like murder. You commit murder, you're stoned to death. You commit adultery, you're stoned to death. That's, that's, that's God's attitude. Adultery is as bad as murder or witchcraft or any other thing that the Bible says is a capital crime. But when an unmarried man seduced a, an unmarried and unbetrothed girl, they weren't put to death, but they were forced to marry. They were required to marry. Now, that doesn't mean it was okay. It means they... Unmarried people shouldn't do that. And if you did, when you're unmarried, you've got to become a married couple because God, uh, basically, you broke it, you bought it. You know? Uh, so if you're, you know, if you get into that kind of relationship that only belongs in marriage, well, shame on you. Get married now. And that's uh, another way of saying you, sex doesn't belong outside of marriage. It sometimes occurs outside of marriage, but if it does, fix it by getting married. 
Now, I want to say this, too. There are many people here who, before they were Christians, probably had multiple partners. And you might say, well, I'm supposed to go marry all those people? No, no. Actually, the law was if the girl was a virgin, if a man actually deflowered a virgin, uh, she can't get that back. And in that society, she's less, to put it crassly, less marketable in the marriage market in Israel uh, if she's not uh, viewed as, as pure. So, so the man who uh, defiled her has to take on the responsibility of being her husband and, and take care of her and never divorce her. It's interesting because the law of Moses did allow divorce for some causes, but not in that case. If a single man had sex with a virginal woman who's not betrothed to someone else, he had to marry her and they can never divorce. So, I mean, that makes it very clear that God has no place in his economy for sex going on outside of marriage. And, that, and fornication, in the Greek, the word is porneia, which sounds a lot like one of our English words, porneia. And, uh, and of course, our word pornography is based on that word porneia. But porneia in the Greek means uh, sexual immorality. In the older English, King James, they call it, it's translated fornication. But uh, a lot of modern translations just call it sexual immorality. And there's a good reason for that. And that is because we sometimes think of fornication as only marriage uh, that isn't adultery. Like only premarital sex is fornication. But if people get married and then commit adultery, that's something else. But actually in the Bible, porneia is used for any kind of sexual activity that's not within the bounds of biblical marriage. So, for example, when a man was involved in an incestuous relationship with his father's wife, in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1, it says, Paul says, there's fornication in the church. Well, incest then was called fornication. In Jude, it says that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were involved in fornication. Well, they were involved in homosexual activity. In the Old Testament, in the Greek Old Testament, uh, when God talked about Israel's, you know, worshiping other gods, he said that's fornication, which is really an analog of adultery. Uh, so really any kind, of course, bestiality was also sexual. There's a lot of different ways to be sexually sinful. And certainly uh, we know the word fornication was used for uh, prostitution. In other words, any kind of sexual misbehavior was under the umbrella term porneia. So when Jesus said, if a man divorces his wife for any cause other than porneia, it means that the grounds for divorce are whatever may fall under the umbrella of porneia. And that would be if, if he gets involved in a gay relationship or with another woman or whatever, you know, that's porneia. And again, it just underscores that there's only one proper place for sex to be, and that is within the marriage relationship. Now, of course, what the Bible teaches is, and Jesus taught this from, from Genesis 2.24, that a man and his wife become one flesh. He said, here's what you learn from the way God made it from the beginning. And whatever may have happened after the fall, that's not the norm for us. Our norm is how did God make it? We figure the way he made it is the way he wanted it, and what we want is what he wants. That's just what it means to be a Christian. I've decided from now on, it's not about what I want, it's about what God wants. That's what repent does. When you repent, you change your mind. Before you repented, you wanted it your way. That's just natural. You repent and say, no, I don't want it my way. Jesus said, if you come here, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross. No one would choose that, but you do that because you do what God wants. That's what changing your mind and repenting means you now are not living to please yourself, but to please God. And what God was pleased by was what he made in the beginning, you know, when he said it's very good, before it got very bad. And so, we, we have a, a standard here that marriage is monogamous, because God only made one wife for Adam. Now, did God tolerate uh, polygamy in the Old Testament? He did. He also tolerated divorce and some other things. Because of the hardness of heart, God didn't enforce the highest standards on them, knowing how weak and foolish and carnal people were. He wasn't just going to strike everyone dead who did something wrong. He wouldn't have anyone left. So he, you know, because of the hardness of their heart, he overlooked a lot of things. But 
He never wanted them. God never wanted to be polygamy or divorce. He didn't make Adam several wives. And that's really remarkable when you think about it. Because God told Adam, be fruitful and fill the earth. Now societies that allow polygamy usually have this interesting uh, double standard. A man can have multiple wives, but a wife can't have multiple husbands. And that's generally true everywhere that polygamy is practiced. Why? Why the double standard? Well, for the simple reason that a man might impregnate many women and multiply his family rather quickly, and there's never any question about who the mother is or the father is. But if a woman had many husbands, no one would know who, who's dad. Yeah. Who's your daddy? I don't know. Mom had six husbands, you know. You, you wouldn't, you know, the parentage of a child would be in question, and you wouldn't multiply children any faster. A woman with seven husbands would still have only one baby at a time. Every nine months she could have one maybe, but, but not more than that unless she had twins. But a man with many wives could have a lot. Now what I'm saying is that's what society recognized when they allowed polygamy. Yeah, a man could have many wives because he could multiply his family that way. In fact, in the Bible, most of the men that we know of by name who had more than one wife, and most men did not, by the way, even when polygamy was allowed, it wasn't normative. Abraham had a, a sterile wife, a barren wife. And it was she who said, why don't you have a baby with Hagar, my servant? And she, Hagar became a second wife to him. And that wasn't even his idea, that was hers. But the point was, it would never come up if Sarai had been able to give him children, but she couldn't. So she said, well, you gotta have children. Here, take her. And the same would be true of Jacob and his four women. Uh, Rachel, was barren initially. Uh, and, and so he had children by Leah, but he only, he, he only really wanted to be married to Rachel and she eventually had children too. But then both of them had, had periods where they stopped having children. And so they said, here, take my maid and have children with her. He ended up with four women who were technically wives, two were concubines, but that's another kind of wife in this society. But only because of barrenness or, or you know, to, to multiply children where there was a, a stoppage there. You see, even Hannah, the mother of Samuel, was almost certainly the second wife of her husband. And the first wife was still living, Peninnah. But, uh, I'm sorry, Peninnah was almost certainly the second wife, my mistake. I think Hannah was the first wife. But she was barren. And so her husband married a woman who could give him children. Now, Although the Bible sometimes uh, records that there were polygamous families, it never records one case of a happy one. Interesting that. Because, uh, you know, the Bible might well have just told us about these without mentioning how happy or unhappy they were. In every case, the Bible goes out of the way to show there's conflict. Whenever there's more than one wife or children of more than one wife, the children are at each other's throats. David had eight wives and his ki kids killed each other, uh, you know. Uh, or Hannah and Peninnah, they had strife. Rachel and Leah had strife. Hagar and Sarah had strife. You never find one instance in the Bible of a polygamous family that's, that the people are happy about it. It's almost like it was just a, uh, a functional thing. We gotta have more kids here. Having kids was a very important thing in the minds of those cultures. And that's probably the main reason why they were open to polygamy. But that's not how God wanted it from the beginning. <laughs> If God wanted Adam to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, that'd happen a lot faster if God gave him 100 women. He could have 100 children a year instead of one a year. Now, the fact that God wanted the whole world populated and didn't give Adam more than one wife, which would have been practically very helpful for that project, means that there were overriding concerns that, that overrode the practicality. God wanted the earth populated, but not at the expense of making a polygamous marriage, which would have made it faster, but there was an overriding concern, monogamy, one husband, one wife. And why is that? In the Old Testament, no one knew why, although they could see that it, polygamy was not a happy arrangement. But in the New Testament, we know it's a picture of Christ in the church. He only has one body, he only has one bride, and to have more, for a man to have more than one wife, 
muddies that picture. And that's not what God had in mind. So God intended for marriage to be monogamous and faithful and lifelong. That's what Jesus said. When God is joined together, don't let man break apart. Now, it might be that you, uh, like myself, have been in a previous marriage, uh, which may have bro broken up on biblical grounds. Now, I didn't divorce my wife, but, but I was certainly felt free when she divorced me because she had been having affairs, the first wife. And uh, that being so, uh, I, I, I would say that a person may be a victim of divorce. And you might say, but God said, don't let anyone break it up. Well, the person who commits adultery is the one who's breaking it up. God joins together. The covenant is broken by adultery. And whoever commits the adultery is the one who breaks it up. Uh, sometimes being divorced is not your fault. And I, I've always heard people say, who don't know what they're talking about, there are no innocent parties in a divorce. Ever heard that line? That's a, that's, a, that's a common line. There are no innocent parties in a divorce. Well, if you mean there's no perfect parties in a divorce, of course, there's no perfect human beings. There are, you know, everyone who is a victim of their spouses divorcing them wrongfully has been an imperfect spouse. But that doesn't mean they're not innocent of the divorce. Both sides are imperfect spouses. The only one who causes the divorce is the one who says, I'm out of here. I'm going to take up with someone else. I'm going to leave this marriage. That's, that's the person guilty. And that certainly often is the case that only one person is guilty of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, anyone who's an innocent party in a divorce can still, uh, you know, castigate themselves in memory of things they did that weren't as good as they should have been. I would think anyone who's been divorced looks back and says, oh, I could have done that better, I could have done that better. But that doesn't mean you caused the divorce. Being imperfect doesn't cause a divorce. Both parties are imperfect. But only the person who says, okay, I'm done here. That person causes the divorce. And she said, don't do that. Whether, whether it's by committing adultery and causing your spouse to have grounds for divorce, or divorcing your spouse when they haven't committed adultery, then you become the adulterer. So Jesus said God had monogamous, lifelong, faithful, and by the way, heterosexual unions in mind. Now, when, uh, when our country decided to uh, legalize same-sex marriages, uh, people say, well, they're redefining marriage. No, they're not. They're undefining marriage. Marriage has no definition now. There's, you know, when you decide that marriage is, should be permitted and uh, authorized and legalized and celebrated as long as two people love each other, well, why do they have to be people? Why can't it be somebody and their dog? And although that sounds facetious, it's a real question because there are actually people who want to marry their pets. There have been court cases where they, they wanted to do that. Why can't a person marry his granddaughter? There are people who actually said they want to do that. I mean, as soon as you say marriage is whatever, whenever two people love each other and want to have sex together, then that's, then that's uh, or two creatures, uh, then, then we're going to let that be marriage. Well, then we put no boundaries around marriage at all. Uh, the truth is, there, there was never any legitimate redefinition of marriage. Because as soon as you gave up the biblical definition of marriage, you replace it with nothing. There, I mean, I'd be very interested in knowing what a dictionary today would put under marriage. There'd probably be such a loosey-goosey, vague thing there because, you know, it's changing in people's minds all the time. But what changes in people's minds doesn't mean it changes in God's mind. And uh, we will not be judged by what people think. We'll be judged by what God thinks. And people who are Christians are those who don't mind going against the status quo of the world and, and going with what God says. It, yeah, you'll be called a hater. You'll be called phobic. You'll be called other things. You might even be beat up. Uh, you never know. Uh, or that uh, marriage is a man and a woman. There are people who've done that. They've, and got, who was the guy who was, what was he, the head of something? corporations. Uh, he just had, had said, actually years earlier, he had written in a 
social media thing that marriage is a man and woman. He's like the vice president of one of these big corporations. It's in the news. But we have to say, okay, uh, if the world hates me, that means we're going to have to be different than the world. And it's going to be more and more obvious that we're different from the world because this is the area that the world is changing. The world is the sexual revolution, the sexual freedom. Um, you know, it's it's got no it's got no boundaries now of any kind. Tolerate the boundaries you put on today. Like you say, no, you can't marry your granddaughter. Well, wait another five years and see if those boundaries hold up. No logical stopping place for that. Now, I'm gonna give you a break in just a minute, but I just want to say this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, your mind makes is your thing. opinions. Those, that's your mind. We're not talking about the physical brain. You're, the Christian's physical brain as an organ made up of neurons doesn't, as far as I know, change significantly as a result of being a Christian. The brain is like the heart or the lung. It's a physical organ. But the mind is the processes of thought. And that's what has to be renewed. And that's what you have to not care whether your thinking conforms with the world or not. So do not be conformed to the world. Uh, it's a very unpopular thing to stand against the world. I remember the first time I remember that verse coming to mind was back in the beginning, like the hippie days. And it was some kind of a Jesus people hippie kind of uh, newsletter or, not, or magazine or something. And someone called, do not be conformed to this world because the hippies were seeing themselves as non-conformists until, of course, there's nothing more conformative than being a hippie, you know? I mean, when they started growing their hair long and wearing, you know, rags and things like that, and, uh, you know, which I did those things too. But I, I thought, we're not conforming to the world here. We're non-conformists. And then eventually the whole reason for doing it was conformity to the world. Uh, of course, I do it for other reasons now. I'm not conforming to the world. I'm just being myself, <laughs> which may or may not be okay. But the truth is, we think of conformity, at least some people think of conformity in terms of style, hairstyle, you know, those kind of things, outward things like that. But the non-conformist that Paul's calling for is don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Start thinking differently. And, and you're gonna stand out like a sore thumb if you do. Because the world has a lot of opinions about sexuality that you're going to have to say, no, that's not right. No, that's not right. No, nope, you're wrong on that one too. And, uh, and you're just going to be, you know, the bad guy. You're going to be the bad guy in so many conversations. Let me real quickly, before we take a break, tell you some of the ways the world thinks about this that you're just not going to have to, you're not going to be able to go along with. One, of course, is that we are products of evolution, products of nature, and therefore, uh, we're just animals. And like animals, you know, alley cats go around and they have sex with whoever they want to. Well, there's no more reason for them to do that than for us to do that. Uh, we're supposed to, you know, reproduce after our kind and, and, and we're supposed to, you know, supposed to spread our genes around and so forth. I mean, if we're animals, there's no basis for sexual morality. There might be a social basis. Some might say, well, we're highly evolved animals and we realize that society will fall apart if there's total promiscuity. There needs to be families, there needs to be some stability. Yeah, but that's not arguing morally. That's, that's pragmatically. That's simply saying, you know, society is a better place if people aren't all raping each other. But to say that it's transcendentally and morally wrong to do so, you can't, can't make that argument if you're just an animal. There's no moral wrong with animals, having sex with other animals, there's no marriage among them. Now there are a few species that you know pair up for life, storks and some others I think do that, but most animals don't. And, uh, and why should we? Why should we bother with it? We're just animals. Well, we're not animals, that's just the point. All the animals were created first and then God said, let's make man in our own image. 
in our likeness. This is not another animal. This is closer to another god. Now, we're not gods, of course, but we, we've got a part of us that's in the image of animals and part of us that's in the image of God. And therefore, animals are not our role models. You know, sometimes the, the gay uh, activists would say, well, you know, you can see a homosexual sex or same-sex uh, activity in some of the species of animals. <clears throat> True. Not, not as a regular habit, but you do find ex examples of it. But they're not our role models. Animals are not our role models. Uh, and people who act like animals are not our role models. God is our role model. So uh, this idea that we're, you know, we're just products of nature, it's natural for animals to you know, do what they do, and so why shouldn't we? Well, we're going to have to stand against that. Um, when people say the sex drive is just as much a natural and okay appetite as, as food is. Well, it's true, it's natural, but it's not the same. As I said, what you eat, well, you should do that to the glory of God too. But frankly, if you eat unhealthy food, you're not breaking any particular commandment of God. Uh, there's no moral stigma to eating things. There is a moral stigma uh, associated with the sex. It's not on the same level with food appetite. Um, there's a, the world thinks you can safely have sex outside of marriage. We now have birth control. We have antibiotics. We even have abortion. And therefore, the things that used to make it dangerous or risky to have sex out of marriage, they're not there anymore. STDs, we can usually take care of those with antibiotics. Pregnancies can be avoided or terminated. Uh, you know, so you can have safe sex. Well, it depends. If the reason you are trying to uh, avoid unsafe sex is because you're trying to avoid uh, inconvenience, like having a baby that you didn't plan on, or being sick with a sexually transmitted disease, yeah, okay, there are a certain, there are certain uh, inconveniences of uh, sexual promiscuity that can be remedied or whatever if you don't have any conscience, but <coughs> you can't become a virgin again. You can't become pure again. It's not safe to violate the law of God and think that it's not going to make its mark on your mind and on your heart and on your character. We are not stones that don't change. We are malleable souls that are shaped by the decisions we make, by guilt and by righteousness and by things like that. It's not, sex is not just something that you want to avoid inconveniences that are a result of it. It's something where it's got a moral dimension that marks you and changes you. And uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's a lot easier to be sexually pure when you're a young, when you're a virgin than when you're a divorcee. Or maybe not divorcing, maybe you've been involved sexually with someone before and, and you're now trying not to. Uh, it's a lot, a lot easier. I know because I was a virgin. I was a virgin when I got married the first time. And then I was a divorcee against my will. And I will tell you, life in that area has been much more difficult, much more challenging. Uh, and you'd think the teenage years are the most challenging. You know, that's when your hormones are just firing and, and you know, young, usually young men in their adolescent years are considered that's the time when the sex drive is the strongest. Well, I, that might be true in some cases, but what, when you're a virgin, although you think about it and you have temptation, it's just, it's easier to kind of stay a virgin when you're already one. But once you've thrown that part away, uh, even when you get old, when normally you might think, well, that's when the sex drive is not so strong, not so many, not so much testosterone there and so forth. Yeah, but it's, it's still harder after having been one flesh with somebody than before. And you do, when you do violate God's standards, you do harm to yourself. You change something about your character and your, and your innocence. Remember Adam and Eve, it wasn't sex that they did, but when they sinned, they suddenly knew they were naked and wanted to hide. Before that, when they were innocent, they were naked and they were not ashamed. They had nothing to hide. It's when you've done something that marks your conscience as you, you're not okay anymore. Suddenly, it alienates you from people. You want to hide. You don't want to show yourself. You don't want to be transparent. There's something different inside of you now. 
In that case, we, it was shame. And so there's no safe sex outside of God's boundaries. Um, there are other dangers besides the physical ones that people often think about. Um, there's a certain mentality that some people have that if you repress your sexual drive, let's just say you remain a eunuch or you remain a, a virgin or whatever, that you have to do psychological damage to yourself because those, that repressed uh, sex drive is going to manifest itself in, in mental illness or whatever, you know. And, and this is, of course, just uh, somebody talking who doesn't have much experience with it. Uh, most people who say that are not virgins, and they don't know that it's not impossible to be mentally healthy and a virgin. Daniel was. Uh, you know, uh, Joseph eventually got married. Daniel never did, but Joseph, uh, and, and by the way, Jeremiah never got married. Uh, Joseph in Egypt, he eventually got married, but not until he was an adult and had resisted sexual temptation under some very strong temptation and so forth. Uh, he was not mentally ab uh, you know, unbalanced because of uh, repressing a sex drive. Um, one might justify going wrong sexually on that basis, but uh, it's not a real justification. Now, living pure, whether you're a virgin or whether you're married and staying faithful to a spouse, or maybe you've been abandoned by a spouse or you're a widow or a widower, uh, staying pure will not be unhealthy. It'll be something you'll never regret. In fact, I will say that when you are on your deathbed looking back over your life, the things you are likely to regret most were indiscretions in that area if you had them. Um, I don't know why, but, but sexual sin is different than other things. It has a different mark on the conscience. Uh, anyone who is dying and they're thinking over their life and they have either been a virgin or they've been faithful to their spouse and they've been pure, they, they're going to die with an easier, easier conscience than otherwise, I believe. And uh, so the world it gives us all kind of messages that aren't right. They say that gender is a social construct and that uh, sexual morals are, are social constructs. And uh, that, that's not true. It's God designed it. God designed it for a purpose. And if you use it for some purpose other than what God designed it for, there is damage that you probably cannot calculate. That will happen. It's like if someone invents a screwdriver for uh, you know, driving screws, but you use it to try to drill holes in, in uh, two by fours, uh, you, it's not gonna work well, and it's probably not gonna be good for the tool eventually. It's, you know, it's not what it's made for. And so we know what sex is made for. Now I wanna talk, when we come back from a break, just about um, what I'd call spiritual warfare in this area, because it's very, very difficult even in a society that isn't as promiscuous as ours and as deceived and, and uh, gone so far afield as ours, it's very difficult just to fight your hormones. But then there's more than that. There's society and there's pressure and there's TV and internet and you know <coughs> advertising and things like that. There's all kinds of things assaulting us. We're under a tremendous spiritual attack in this area. So I want to be able to talk a little bit about this spiritual warfare in the air before we're done. And we're gonna have Q&A at the end, but we're gonna take a break right now for, I'd say, five minutes, just so you can stretch, get something to drink, there's water out there, go to the bathroom, and we'll start up again in about five minutes.